I know many of you in, in the audience, right? But for those who don't, or for those who forgot, uh, my name seems to be Volker Bloom, and I am at Duke University in Durham, North Carolina, and actually in the Department of Mechanical Engineering and Material Science, and also chemistry, but a physicist by training. And the topic of this talk is uh, large-scale electronic structure theory in FHI Ames and LC. And so FHI Ames is a general purpose electronic structure code that can do lots of things, but one of the directions we've been trying to push it is to do large calculations on hopefully very large supercomputers efficiently and precisely. Uh, that's one of the reasons we actually started this code. It's based on numeric atom-centered basis sets. I'll say a very few words about this later, but it's important that that, that prescription is there because it enables the all-electron calculations at pretty reasonable cost. And then eigenvalue and density matrix solutions are um, another topic that I'll talk about, because for quite a while we've been trying to uh, work on uh, an open source framework that bridges to different eigenvalue solvers and also density matrix solvers that are in the community. So Lin Lin is, for instance, in the audience here, and he uh, was heavily involved in, in that project. And so we, uh, I'll talk about LC, which is electronic structure infrastructure, this layer that abstracts this and that is used in, in several codes. And uh, ELPA, uh, an eigenvalue solver that I uh, was involved in the, the co-founding of and that we still heavily use, uh, will also uh, play a role. And then finally, I'll talk about um, one of the developments in FHR Ames that we've been pushing for several years now, which is large-scale hybrid density functional uh, uh, theory. Uh, so what you see here actually uh, looks like a small box. It's really actually 1,500 atoms uh, in a box, and that's because it's an organic-inorganic hybrid semiconductor. The um, organic molecules are here, are these thin wireframes that are barely visible. Uh, the inorganic component are these layers here. Uh, they contain lead. One of these lead atoms has been replaced by a bismuth defect, and you can see that the wave function associated with an electron trapped on this bismuth defect is actually quite extended. And so 1,500 atoms is actually not a particularly large structure to want to model. But if you're interested in semiconductors and defect levels, you're interested in the electronic levels themselves. And so hybrid DFT is sort of the lowest starting point that maybe gives you some insight into where these levels are. And so that's what we do, but that's already fairly costly. And so I'll, I'll later say that we can also do 30,000 atoms, but the 1,500 atom calculation here is certainly useful. So this is what I intend to talk about. I'll also thank the funding agency, for instance, uh, agencies. For instance, the work on ELSI has really been uh, instrumentally funded by the National Science Foundation for many years, and that's great. Um, and uh, the work on the organic-inorganic semiconductors, not the DFT per se, but the, the fact that we actually know what those are and that we have interesting science questions to answer, were also funded by NSF and by the Department of Energy in an uh, um, uh, energy frontier research center called Center for Hybrid Organic-Inorganic Semiconductors for energy and choice. And on the last slide, in case I forget to mention, are all the supercomputing centers on which we rely, and particularly NERSC. So with, uh, without NERSC, we wouldn't have done, gotten much done in the last few years. So that's, uh, those are the acknowledgments. That's not all the acknowledgments, so my group. I, I wanted to say that we are at Duke University, and so here is uh, our small, modest chapel that's on campus, so which is the center of uh, Duke West Campus. Uh, the group really consists of uh, several graduate students. So um, Yi Yao, for, uh, sorry, Yu Yi Song here just graduated, Ji Shi Chin, uh, Gabi mm -hmm. Kognat, and Tian Ling. Tian Ling Wang are carrying on the work. Yi Yao is actually a postdoc who now moved to Berlin and who is an excellent method developer uh, who is responsible for some of the work uh, in here. And, and uh, Victor Yu is kind of the father of the ELSI project and now moved to Julia Gully's group in, uh, in, in, in Chicago. William Hoon, similarly central to many of our... Um, uh, efforts. He's now actually uh, at Intel, and, and many others, including actually many uh, undergraduate and master students that are current in the group. So FHI aims uh, the code. Um, this is really a long-term thing. Uh, uh, once upon a time, I finished my PhD in Erlangen, Germany, on metal alloys. So I have some metal alloys past, and moved to Boulder, Colorado, to sit in the cubicle next to Paul Kent, who's in the audience. So that's great, um, and. Uh, uh, did alloys. Uh, but then I learned that in Berlin there was an idea of starting a new electronic structure code, and so this was supposed to solve a few problems that we had. Uh, among them, that we had different tools for periodic systems and non-periodic systems. And we knew this didn't have to be the case, but, but plane wave codes uh, that are ubiquitous in solid-state physics are 
well, uh, inherently periodic at some level. And so we wanted to simplify this. We wanted something that got rid of uh, pseudopotentials, and I know that pseudopotentials and PAWs can be done very well for many purposes. But we also ran into a few problems, and so if you don't have to deal with them, if the all-electron method is actually affordable, then you, you know, can deal with the all-electron method. Um, and we wanted something that would be able to scale to large systems, and so in practice, we end up uh, in the uh, Dave Bowler conundrum, which is uh, that systems should be larger, and we are still limited in practice in many simulations to thousands of atoms. But in my group, I would say that thousands of atoms is where we end up typically, not just hundreds of atoms. Hundreds of atoms are very useful for a lot of science, so it's not that we don't want to do hundreds of atoms. We'd like to do that too, but we'd like to do more. And if we can do more, uh, that's a good thing. So we wanted the scalability without precision limitations built in at the outset, uh, however. And it should be scalable from a laptop uh, uh, to uh, seamlessly parallel high-performance computers, including uh, hopefully GPUs, and, and that's actually the case. So uh, we have density functional theory, which I'll spend most of this talk talking about, because that's still the primary method um, that is practical for quantum uh, simulations. It's not actually the end of all things. We should be doing much more, except the cost goes up uh, again. And so the reason I'm mostly focusing on density functional theory in this talk is because the hybrid functionals are actually instrumental for and, and very productive for much of what we've done. If we could do GW at the same scale, we would. And maybe we'll do that someday, because it's uh, of interest. And, and a lot of people are working in FHR AIMS actually on pushing GW for many years. In molecules, uh, I think we were the first who actually did reasonably well converging uh, GW calculations and still do. The critical choice that I mentioned on the first slide in this code is that it's not plane waves and it's not some uh, other um, uh, uh, standard basis. It is a standard basis because we didn't invent it. We use so-called numeric atom-centered basis functions, which have the atomic solutions exactly in the calculation. They don't need to, but it's convenient to have spherically symmetric atoms solved exactly at the outset. And then you can do the rest with relatively few additional basis functions. And you can stay scale from light, uh, fast, but not crazy calculations, to something that is very tight and, and very precise if you want to. And so that's what we, we sit on. And that is very good, especially you know, on the density functional theory side of things has carried us for a long time. And the code itself is actually something that's stewarded by a nonprofit. So this is MS1P, which is a nonprofit that sits in, in Germany. But that's very helpful because something in the community has to coordinate the code and, and how it's uh, distributed. And so this is a very active, big community. Um, I just wanted to point that out because that's something I'm somewhat proud of. Even if I run out of uh, time, I don't have my time before me, actually, which is a problem. But I, I, I want to mention these roughly 150 names here that are also on the code website. Uh, the code is coordinated by myself, so I, I think I do have the privilege of having written the first line. Sebastian Kokot in Berlin, who uh, carries a lot of the daily work. Mariana Rossi, who is really uh, uh, always there. And then Matthias Scheffler, in whose environment all this was, of course, started, and without whom this would not have funded at Fritz Haber Institute. Many others have, collaborated, have cooperated, but it's really a, a very large community of people that contribute to this and make it work in academia. All right. Then what other software do we do? This is a quick run through. I'll come back to this later. So this is the idea behind the LC project, which has also been a lot of fun uh, over the years. So this is actually something that's in the end not just used in my group. So Siesta and, and BFTB Plus in particular, and also DGDFT have used this interface as electronic structure codes. And basically, this comes from the realization that we all face the same basic matrix or, or vector problems at some level, and so we should be able to interface them into an abstract interface that takes various formats, converts if necessary, uses a solver such as LAPAC, perhaps, right? We could do that, and we can. Or ELPA as a massively parallel eigensolver, which is pretty robust and, and, and in our experience hard to beat. Or perhaps antipoly, which is an order n method uh, that's developed by William Dawson and, and others and is also used in big DFT. Or perhaps PEXI, which is, I think, Lynn's uh, work and, and group for many years. And so that's the idea behind LC. And we try to uh, move this forward. And it's actually stable and the, the basis for eigen solver and density matrix scalability in FHI aims, at least. We also work on other things. So we have something that I don't mention very frequently in, in talks. But we do have a graphical interface. We call it GIMS, Graphical Interface for Material Science. And what you can't see here, although you can here if you look closely, is that this is actually a browser-based interface. 
So it has no installation overhead. You go to this website and it's there. You can also run your own instance because it's open source. It's somewhere in Journal of Open Source Software. We did this on purpose. It sits on ASE, so Atomic Simulation Environment. But it gives you a visual impression of what you're actually building, including the Brillouin zone that you're choosing and various other things. And so this is supported by two codes at this point, FHR Ames, but also exciting. And this is for the simple reason that we did not want this to be something that was restricted to a single code. So if one builds a plug into this, one can actually abduct this to any other code and it's very useful. And actually also, in principle, as a tool to um, illustrate things for teaching. And then finally, on a completely different note, I mentioned NSF and hybrid perovskites before. We started a project on hybrid perovskites that had a database component, but out of this came this software, which is called MatDecubed, um, which we use uh, quite happily to uh, put data on materials on our group's website. And so this is a, an open source package that sits on Django uh, and, and similar open source software, but essentially gives you a clean representation of materials and, and any, of, any of their properties uh, that you can abduct uh, to publicize work uh, that's otherwise somewhere buried in a paper. So if you have a materials property or a material that's of interest or a group that does material science, in principle one can put stuff into a database like this and publicize it and, and make it visible and organized to the world, including all sorts of curated input. So this is not high throughput. This is actually manually input, and, uh, and, and, and the knowledge is hopefully preserved. So that's almost what my group does. Then I, I'm actually, as you can see, quite interested in libraries, and that's not just because they're useful, but also because they're fun, um, uh, because you actually get to talk to people who you would otherwise not talk to, right? Usually we, we stand there and say that our electronic structure code is the best. Now, I happen to know that FHA Ames is the best, but I think a few people in this audience <laughs> think otherwise, even if they don't say, though, I suspect them of thinking otherwise, and so that's terrible. Um, <laughs> but wouldn't it be nice to be able to talk to them, right? And so it's, it's, this is another practical aspect of having something like a collection of libraries that you actually use underneath your code. It doesn't just simplify your life. In many cases, you actually get to talk to people and develop things together. And so we have this electronic structure library that was funded, founded, and, and also funded for many years by, by, by SECAM. I, I took out uh, the key slide. Hopefully that comes back later. Um, it's missing. Uh, so uh, this was started by Emilio Artacho and some others in 2014, and is basically run as a series of yearly workshops. The next one actually will be in 2024 in Lausanne, and so there are two, day, two days of high-level discussions and then eight days of, of coding uh, for a group of people who can be PhD students, postdocs, and who are there and work on libraries together. And if you're interested in this, please, please consider this. So this is not yet on, uh, it is actually on the website in the meantime, um, but more importantly, uh, it'll happen in about a year from now, and so save the date for this. All right. So with this, I really do need to get at my time. I don't have this in front of me. Here we are. So let's see how we do. Electronic structure theory. So this is one standard of electronic structure theory, but probably the thing that most people in electronic structure theory tend to use, which is Kohn-Sham uh, in 1965. So this is, a, this is actually the non-relativistic um, uh, Kinetic energy operator. How many people do non-relativistic calculations in this room? Some do. Uh, so uh, the pseudo-potentials are usually scalar relativistic, right? So we forget this. Uh, but, but some people might actually be doing non-relativistic calculations anyway, but there's no reason to do that. It's written here anyway. Um, I'm saying this as an asterisk because actually, of course, we have an interest in relativity, and if I get to this, uh, I'll say something uh, about it later, and it's been orbit coupling and getting things right. But we have these potentials here, including the exchange correlation potential, which all depend on uh, the orbitals effectively via the density. And so this is a set of nonlinear eigenvalue problems. This is straightforward to solve. We first pick a basis set, which is what almost everybody does. Not quite everyone, but mostly. Uh, once we do that, we uh, create a linear uh, combination uh, for an approximate solution. We transform this into a generalized eigenvalue problem. Could be a standard eigenvalue problem. And the Hamilton matrix and overlap matrix have the form of some kind of integral. And so this is all feasible. And then we still have to deal with self-consistency, as you know. So we start with an initial guess. We get a density. We get a potential and so on. And we repeat this uh, uh, until we finish. And so the very short uh, comment on basis sets in this talk, because I assume that this audience has just heard about other basis sets and various ones, 
is that we use these functions here, numeric atom-centered functions, uh, as basis functions. And so these are not incredibly radical. In fact, they're probably some of the first things that, that Slater and others came up for basis sets in, uh, in the 1930s. Um, but there are many implementations, and demolecule by, by, by Delhi in particular was the one that proved to the Berliners before I moved here, moved there, uh, that this was actually a, a useful prescription, except uh, demol at the time wasn't something uh, they could develop on for reasons that I wasn't there uh, for. And so um, we started a new code, but based on this prescription, which is essentially YLM functions up to a certain angular order at every atom, and then radial functions. And the nice thing is that the radial function can be anything you like. So we typically define radial functions through Schrodinger-like radial equations, because that's convenient. You can, for instance, add a cutoff potential uh, somewhere, and these are the radial functions that come out. But you have two things to define. The, this cutoff potential here is something that can go to infinity. That's the black line here and pushes basis functions to exactly zero at some radius, and that can be far away from the atom, so five or six angstroms. So this doesn't have to be a strong restriction, and this is an important point. It's just there to make your numerical life simple where it should be simple. But the key point is that this potential here can be chosen as anything you like either. So this could be a free atom-like potential that defines your radial functions, or, which is what happens mostly to us, is, is hydrogen-like uh, functions. So again, Slater-type orbitals in some form, but with an effective parameter here, z. Um, or maybe uh, free ions, uh, which we also use, or Gaussians or others, uh, as you can think of. Yes? Can you have it flexible so it's, it changes during SEFs? Environment or it, it changes to. It changes while you're doing your SEFs. So can we do flexible? Or do your issues it fixed? Can we do flexible basis functions? We could, but we've never implemented it. In fact, in my very first um, tries, I implemented the infrastructure that would have allowed us to do this, but I was more worried about systematic en errors in energy differences at the time, and I still am. And so it's never been a restriction. It turns out that in my experience, if you want to fix a basis set issue, going to a larger basis set hierarchically is actually the better choice, because you're sure that you're going to improve something. But that's just my experience, right? But you could do this flexibly, yes, like in, LM2, in principle. LM2 functions, uh, linearized Muffetian orbital method, yeah. for example. Yeah, so LMTO is, of course, similar and related, but we don't change the radial functions. In principle, this is possible, yeah. But as I said, in my experience, it's actually been better to just change the basis, increase the basis set wholesale. Yeah. Let me see where I am. Sorry. Yeah. But this is, this is a good point, right? In principle, that's not, not, not impossible to implement. But the key point is that these are localized functions, and because the atomic functions are in there, it's something that gets you the core uh, orbitals. Uh, you obviously need efficient and enough radial functions, and so, so I spent uh, a year or two of my life, and, and a few others too, uh, to create a basis at library that's essentially a tabulated list of basis functions that's described in, in this paper down here, the construction principle, um, for all elements up to uh, 1 to 102, and this can be uh, small basis sets, or they can be large basis sets. So it allows you to really tune the accuracy of the calculation as you need it. All right. So in, in practice, this is actually uh, quite simple uh, because uh, there's an input file to the code which you can just paste in. For instance, these are tight settings for hydrogen. You paste this in the, into the input file and most people don't look at it, but if you're so inclined, you can, and you can actually comment in or comment out pre-tabulated basis functions, or you can build your own if you, if you want to play with them and do something different. So this is very simple. All right. Uh, so why do we know it works? We did a lot of tests here and there, and, and, and uh, of course there's lots of chemistry out there, and so whenever you do a test, you find something else to test. Thankfully, Stéphane Cotinier came around and did the Delta test, which was published in Science a few years ago, convincing about uh, 40, uh, well, 70 co-authors, really, uh, uh, 40 different data set, uh, uh, sets, uh, communities around 40 different data sets to compare results for energy versus volume curves for 70 elements, 71. And although this is a simple exercise, it had not been done, and it flushed out a few things. In our case, the test was carried out by somebody else. So they had the manual, and they did send me a, que a question or two, uh, but I didn't do very much in this. And I'm quite proud of this, because, of course, that's why we started. And we ended up with our um, uh, highly precise settings in the range where we should, which is close to the all-electron values, uh, more or less indistinguishably close uh, to the others. And those values, I'm also quite proud of, we did not have to change. So I think the others over the years moved closer to us, and that I'm quite happy about. 
All right, so what, what can we do with this in practice? So I, I, um, I'm conscious of the time. Uh, so this is the example that you saw uh, in the beginning. And so for that kind of uh, uh, approach, which was a bismuth doped hybrid organic inorganic semiconductor, which will show up shortly on the slide, well, we relax the structure. And we did a lot of tests because we have excellent colleagues who can do high precision X-ray diffraction. And so we know um, by comparing that um, for the structure, something like PBE with a kachenko scheffler correction actually works remarkably well. So that's semi-local DFT for a few hundreds or maybe a few thousand atoms uh, with a van der Waals correction, which is critical. But uh, these things contain molecules, as you'll see, and so that's why you need the van der Waals correction. And then for energy band structures, it would be great if we could do many body theory, but in the hundreds and thousands of atoms, that becomes slightly costly if you want to converge your calculations in any reasonable sense. Uh, hybrid DFT, of course, has been advocated by many people uh, over the years to at least give you band gaps for the mathematically correct reasons, if you parameterize this right. Um, and so we've stuck with the HSE functional and uh, spin orbit coupling to do this for many years, although it would be great if we could go further and hopefully someday we'll be able to do this. But um, on the bright side, we can do something like this, right? We have this uh, structure that I showed you on the first slide, which is a bismuth atom replacing one lead atom in otherwise uh, 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 a normal phenethyl ammonium lead iodide crystal. This is a standard uh, layered uh, perovskite semiconductor, which was first synthesized in the 1990s. And you can see the um, valence bands down here. You can see the green bands, which are lead derived, which are the conduction bands of this uh, material up here. Um, you can see two cyan levels here, and one of these is an occupied bismuth level, which is this state here. And this would have been great, except it's too low. So what we also found is that this is 0.5 electron volts below the Fermi level, so below the conduction band, whereas we would have liked to have it much closer, so it would actually be doping uh, the crystal. So that, that's what we learned. But we can pinpoint this thing, and it's a flat band. That's what I would like to stress, right? This does not overlap with the... Uh, other bands, and so it's really a well-separated state as it should be uh, for a defect state. All right, uh, what, how was this done? This is actually uh, uh, the version of two years ago, so in the meantime, this got a little faster even. But this was done on the Stampede 2 supercomputer at Texas um, Advanced Computing Center. At the time, it was, I think, number 35 on the top 500 list. It was a large computer. We used 260 nodes, and the, the hybrid DFT calculation for this, this, this particular structure costs about four hours, and each node has 48 CPU cores. So this is a large calculation, but it's not undoable with the hardware that we have. So it's not exascale, actually. So this is feasible. All right. Uh, the other parallelism that someone pointed out uh, recently, and therefore I put it in, which we can also do in practice, is quite useful, is that, of course, we can burn lots of resources by running a feature aims in parallel by just splitting the communicator. This was implemented long ago and started by our colleagues around uh, Scott Woodley at UCL London. And um, so Andrew Logsdale did a lot of work on this also in, in, in Cardiff. And so we can just call FHR Ames as a subroutine because that's really what it is. It's a subroutine call with a communicator. If you split your global communicator into a subcommunicator and then reassign it, you can call it like this. You can have a thousand calculations in different directories and you can run them at once through a queuing system. And actually, Rui Song, who's depicted here, did this because we have this experimental paper that just appeared on chiral perovskite nanoplatelets but we didn't know the structure of the absor adsorption of molecules on a perovskite <coughs> nanostructure. So no X-ray diffraction here. We needed to find out likely structures, and Rui just used Perlmutter in its testing phase when it was uh, not usable, I think, by very many people yet, and it was empty. I didn't know uh, <laughs> how fast or how much he ran, but, uh, but um, uh, he ran essentially 8,000 calculations fully relaxed at intermediate settings, which is actually good enough for uh, anything we do. Um, periodically, uh, with DFT uh, PBE, all electron, and we got uh, lowest energy structures out that we could then analyze, and that worked. And that was fast. So the typical scaling wall, though, as you already know, for electronic structure theory that's, state, that's quoted as something else, and it's eigenvalue uh, solvers, uh, and so this is a picture that Victor Yu uh, made many years ago for a 4,050 atom graphene monolayer. If you remember Edison uh, at, at NERSC, then you know uh, that this has to be relatively old. But for us, this is basically to show that the total time in a, a calculation, which is the black line, 
is dominated by the red line in such a case, which is um, uh, the eigenvalue solver. And this is already with an eigensolver that's fairly heavily optimized. So the ELPA eigensolver is a, is a good eigensolver uh, for parallel uh, applications. And the, the grid-based and other operations for PDE are somewhere down here. So clearly we need to do something about the eigensolver if we want to do more, as others have pointed out uh, before us. And um, yeah, this is the slide that I would have liked to see before. I put it into the LC because this is actually how this project uh, started. It was actually Emilio Atacho who sent this email on the overall electronic structure library. Here all, there will be a workshop in SECAM at Lausanne aiming to kickstart an electronic structural library, by which he means a library of libraries, which is actually what we have at this point. And so this electronic structure library is done by, by, by these people here who have been the curators uh, for many years, and many more have contributed over the years, so you, so you can find this at SECAM. But importantly, for us, it was the, uh, for me personally, it was the impetus to try and uh, see if we could get something similar together on, on, on the US side, at least on the Solver uh, uh, library side, which is where I was active. And so this is how the LC project was actually started. And so um, Lynn is here. John Feng Lu at Duke is known to uh, many in the audience, I think. Chao Yang uh, was involved in this as a collaborator. Alvaro Vasquez, my good here at, at ANL, and Fabiano Corsetti, Corsetti, who is now at, at Microsoft. And these people here are actually the people who uh, made it work. But so this is really um, a simple problem. It's a matrix problem, Hamiltonian matrix, eigenvector, eigenvalue, overlap matrix, eigenvector, um, except it's a large matrix. And so you can use exact solvers, so LAPAC, ScalaPAC, ELPA, others. Uh, you can use iterative solvers, at which point you're typically matrix-free, and you, you might need a, uh, a reverse communication interface if you want to uh, go through the motions of the operations uh, for different reasons. But for matrix-based um, solvers, there's antipoly and then various other implementations that do order n, with some restrictions typically on uh, the, the physical makeup of the system. But PEXI, for instance, for GGA, works without such a restriction, and various others are... Uh, in that area too. So this is the slide that I showed you already in the beginning, uh, which is what this it does. And it's really, in parts, it's a layer um, of uh, 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 interface matrix conversion from one code to uh, another solver, and a layer of solvers that, that sit underneath. And the matrix conversion thing is something that we worked uh, some quite, uh, quite significantly on to make that fast. And it's fast enough for us in FHA Ames anyway. So that's good. And among the solvers that are currently supported are, uh, as I said, LAPAC, ELPA, Eigen, EXA, there's, there's MAGMA actually, there's TEXI, uh, Antipoli, various others. CHASE by Eduardo Di Napoli and co-workers, which is a Chebyshev solver, was recently added. And so we're actually looking forward to playing with that, but I personally haven't played with it yet. There's also a Python interface called LCPy, which was written by uh, Yi Yao at some point. So one can call this whole thing from Python if one uh, wants to. All right. Uh, so what else did we do in this area? Well, we obviously had uh, <laughs> always uh, some new thing to do in terms of development. GPUs became a thing. We had been working on GPUs with, with NVIDIA for, for a while. So Peter Mesmer of NVIDIA started a port of the critical so-called two-stage uh, ELPA solver, ELPA 2, many years ago, I think in 2012 already. And then this, this, this went along. And so Victor, you and Jonathan Musa um, really... Uh, push this forward. Jonathan is at the Molecular Sciences Software uh, Institute and um, uh, created a working and, 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 and uh, well-scaling uh, CUDA implementation of this. And then basically this works on, based on uh, some Kublas and CUDA and, and MPI and, and is offloading wherever possible. Uh, the multiprocess server is something that, that was used and uh, there's a particular step which is numerically tricky, which is not easy to um, put on a GPU, which is um, back transform of a tridiagonal set of uh, solutions to a banded set of solutions. And so that was written with a, a new CUDA kernel. And so the upshot is, so this is this two-stage uh, solver. The upshot is that you go from a dense matrix to a banded matrix to a sparse matrix and back uh, two steps. And um, this, this has a particular advantage if you need maybe half the eigenpairs, not the full uh, number of eigenpairs. And so you can uh, try this out on various computers after all is said and done. So sum it was among them. So these are relatively large matrices, as you can see. And the, the dashed line here, the blue dashed line, is ELPA2 GPU. You can see that the GPU version of the simplified version, where it goes straight from full matrix to tridiagonal and back, so this is the red line here, is actually competitive on few nodes, but then on, on, on many nodes, this ELPA2 
uh, GPU implementation actually wins. CPU scales much better, so uh, there's room for improvement there. And I think that uh, at MPCDF in Garching, who have headed ELPA for a long time, there's some improvement in this area at this point. So this is from our original paper in 2021. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a start and it actually works in reality and also on, on Perlmutter. You know, we were able to test this last summer when, when we were actually able to, to run that. And what you can see here, basically the, the red lines here are important in this plot. That's what happens if you scale down the number of eigenvectors to say 50%. And so the, the time is the dashed line here for Elpa 2, which goes down drastically, so this saves time. Well, we did lots of other things in this area, but one particularly entertaining uh, project was uh, that Gifre Vidal, who was working at the time at a uh, Google subsidiary, uh, contacted us and, and asked if we had an interest in working on Google's tensor processing units. This was mentioned by, by David uh, before. And uh, we did, because it sounded like a fun project. So this is a version 3 TPU plot, and Google says this has more than 100 petaflops. I don't know if the specs for their version 4 are out yet, but this is somewhere on the exascale, I think. And I don't know where exactly, uh, but Google has such computers, and you can, uh, I'm told, take a checkbook. I, I lost my checkbook but I, uh, when I heard. But anyway, um, uh, you can take a checkbook and buy a time and, and run on there, if you can. So what was done here by this team, and this is really Ryan uh, Peterson, who's I think actually in Kieran Burke's group at, uh, at Irvine, uh, and, and, and many others who had written the intermediate uh, libraries. Um, well, we used FHI Ames to calculate matrix elements on a CPU machine. Uh, this was then, as a proof of concept here, written uh, to disk by LC and read in on the TPU machine behind a wall, which was there for, um, uh, for, for, for formal purposes, I think and uh, ran a density matrix purification algorithm, but order and cubed on the TPUs because they can do fast linear algebra and then transform back to uh, CPUs, and actually this worked. And um, so what is shown uh, by that whole team is that essentially uh, uh, this works, and you can plot it on a log-log uh, scale in terms of number of orbitals and time, and you could run at the time 248,000 orbitals. And so this seems to be... Uh, if one of the largest, if not the largest, order and cubed DFT calculation, so without any other restrictions ever run. Uh, had we had access to the hardware still, the team was certain they could have gone to 500,000. So they put an extrapolated set of points there. But I believe that this was, this team was ended due to business reasons at Google. So it not, had nothing to do with the science, but it's very promising and it's still fun. And you can also do single precision, double precision here. And we have some other work on mixed precision in general also that I don't have time to talk about. So that we did, but it turns out that even if you can solve GGA, we're not done, because GGA may not give you the right results, as you all know. And so in particular, you know about the DFT band gap problem. This is perhaps more of a community problem or a community reception problem, because there is no band gap. The original DFT didn't claim uh, to get the band gap, although you can argue that it should have. Um, but Quantram DFT said, well, the eigenvectors and eigenvalues are Fictitious. Nevertheless, everybody uses, and, and then with a long train, of course, of more rigorous work behind it, uh, eigenstates, eigenlevels in Quantram DFT for uh, something that approximates quasi-particle states. And with hybrid DFT and the right um, parameterization, there's at least a reason to expect the band gap to be correct. Uh, you can hope for this. Now, it would be nice, as I said before, to do things like band gaps and quasi-particle band structures with many-body methods for large systems. But this is something that um, not so many people uh, can do, even for hundreds of atoms. Berkeley GW, uh, perhaps, uh, and that has some... Uh, well, there was a talk about this uh, not too long ago here. Um, but thousands, difficult, right? And so many substitute hybrid DFT instead, and that's due to plots like this. So I took this, this database from uh, Scientific Data because they do have a nice plot. They list uh, PBE and related data from the materials product and project, and here experimental band gaps from a set of, I think, 46 materials that they chose. Here are the computed band gaps, and you can see that the band gaps are all too low somewhere, right? And so if you were on this dashed line here, which is dashed over here too, by the way, uh, you'd have the exact answer. And it turns out that if you use HSE, 06 with a standard parameterization, 0.25 for the exchange parameter, the green points emerge and they look much better overall. And you also see that there's a significant scatter. So to the reviewers who keep telling me we need to adjust the alpha to the experimental value that our colleagues um, 
are measured. I say that in many materials we don't know what that alpha is because people parameterize the alpha and we get this perennially, but second, there is a significant scatter and that's of the order of 0.6 electron volts here in this, this range here in which we're interested, right? So you can over-optimize for one material, it's difficult for other materials, and so I've stayed with one parameterization, but the take-home message is that this series actually has a fighting chance of giving you better results than the semi-local DFT version. So because we can do this for large system, we use it. Um, and so we've done this for many years. Uh, we, we, in 2015, after some serious work by, by these people here, um, we actually published uh, a so-called local resolution of identity version, uh, as others have done before us and after us in, in the literature, of the Coulomb operator that basically takes product pairs of uh, basis functions and expresses them in, in a smaller basis. Uh, so if you wish, this is a tensor contraction. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the coefficients follow a rule like this, which you can show gives you uh, error cancellation to, in the linear order uh, in the Coulomb matrix elements. And once you do this, uh, like this, you have the problem that the full resolution of identity will actually delocalize your Coulomb potential over the entire system. Even if it's zero, there'll still be basis functions there that express a zero in various uh, linear combinations. So this is, I'm sorry, hard to see, but this has three spheres around each atom, this image. And um, this basically said, why don't we express the density, which is this product here of two basis functions, just as a function of two atoms locally, not as a function of the third. In short, this loses you the, the linear error cancellation here. But it turns out that if you use enough functions, expansion functions, especially high angular momentum functions, higher angular momentum functions, this actually works really well. And so we did that, and it's carried us ever since in hybrid DFT, and after another fairly significant amount of work, we could actually publish a thousand atoms, gallium arsenide, all electron, no tricks, no symmetry used. Um, exact exchange on a machine that existed in 2015, and you, you took about an hour or so if you had 4096 CPU cores for a single SEF iteration. And that turned out to be fortunate for a lot of the perovskite work that I did because we had systems in the range of hundreds of atoms that needed this. But there's, of course, a lot of other um, systems that are larger, and so this is a fast forward to 2023. And so these people here, uh, collectively, and in particular, Florian Merz and, and Sebastian Kokot did a lot of work to optimize this implementation further and far beyond what I had imagined was possible originally. So systems that are example systems are like liquids with an ion in it, and the charge localization of, of uh, uh, chemical elements in, in uh, GGAs is really not good, and a hybrid functional tends to fix this. Or the system that you've already seen, except see these lines here. This is a different version of the bismuth defect. This actually has two bismuth atoms and a vacancy. This is electrically neutral, and um, who's interested in perovskites in this audience? One, two, I expected as much. For the purposes of this talk, you should be interested in the fact that this line is not quite flat. So if you don't remember anything from this uh, plot, remember that this line is not quite flat as a function of k-space, which means the state isn't entirely localized. It was localized enough for us. Okay, so what was done? Um, 2023, actually 2020 to 2023. MPI3, highly useful in my, 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 in my opinion because it allows shared memory parallelism on a node but without the quagmire of somebody having to set the thread parallelism per by hand before they run, which is the point of failure, I believe, of OpenMP. Because the user has to know what is the thread parallelism that they need ahead of time, and that's a very difficult problem in my experience. MPI3 does it internally, and so if you have the logic, it'll figure it out for you. Nobody needs to find out what thread parallelism you should use. And that's really, in my view, a strong argument for MPI3, and that's why we did this. Well, we compress and exploit sparsity in the RI coefficients. We had already done this before. Otherwise, you can't do order n uh, exact exchange. Uh, there's an auto-tuning mechanism uh, for blocking data, which is very important. This was talked about at this long program before also, and it is important. There are additional parallelization layers, so the parallelization was actually generalized, which is a good thing, uh, and various other tuning mechanisms to load balance. And so that turned out to be a quite extensive amount of work. But it fixed some things. For example, it fixed the memory usage per core on, uh, uh, of, of the different implementations. So this is the 2015 implementation. This is the 2022 implementation here in comparison uh, for the 512 uh, supercell test case, which now seems positively pleasantly small. Uh, but, but you see that the memory uh, use has gone down drastically. This is on an Ice, Ice Lake 72 core machine, the MPCDF. 
which is important because it actually works quite well. And so it enabled all these, uh, uh, these tests. What else happened? So this is the comparison of old plot to new plot, right? Um, these are the data that you saw on the previous machine, Hydra, which was Sandy Bridge 32 cores per node, published in 2015. Remarkably, you can get to basically ideal scaling for the same set of systems on a machine that is not so different. Yes, it has more cores per node. Yes, it's a different iteration. But this here is a log scale. This is orders of magnitude faster. So basically, hard work <laughs> extended this by a significant amount. This is really, to me, is, is remarkable. And so then Sebastian, uh, who uh, presented the slide at the beginning of this week at uh, DPG, German Physical Society, um, put together this slide. And that basically says, look, if you have uh, enough cores, so this is 72 cores per node. And here's the resource usage here, 572 cores, I don't know, um, 2,304 cores. You see that this per SCF iteration takes um, 69 seconds for exact exchange, the system with the 1,000 atoms, and two seconds for the eigensolver. All right, good, good job. So uh, the bigger system, uh, this is a six by six system, so this is curious, right? So it has 3,800 uh, to 383 atoms, right? So far I was talking about 1,500 atoms, but there's a 3,000 atom system that somehow, somehow appears. Okay, so we can do that. It takes 206 seconds per iteration, and, and 43 of this is the eigensolver. You see the eigensolver is actually showing up because the um, hybrid DFT is order n, even though it's expensive. And this isn't tuned down, so these intermediate species defaults are not some kind of excuse. We are using them because we actually tested and they're good enough. Otherwise, we'd use tight. Um, well, you can also be interested in a headache. And so if you want to cure your headache, you can take a paracetamol nanocrystal. And this is what this is with 10,240 atoms, just to show that we can go above 10,000. And indeed, with light species defaults, this can be run. And light is important because a lot of the n square terms still show up in terms of the number of atoms. And so this is... Feasible, this has 101,000 basis functions on a large number of uh, resources. And uh, here uh, we have ice, just to see, say that we can do ice with, with 15,000 something atoms, and it works. And um, you can actually include forces, so Sebastian did that too, because typically you tend to show only the SCF, and the overhead is not too bad. And then finally, just to do it, I think he did 30,000 atoms of this ice on a slightly larger number of cores. This is, again, hybrid DFT and 244,608 atoms it works. It occurred to me yesterday that had he used a few more atoms, he would have actually beaten the TPUs um, but uh, on a regular Intel machine. Uh, so it's possible uh, with the standard ELPA solver. So this is a normal order in cube ELPA eigensolver, nothing special. All right, so this is what we've been working on, and I know that I'm getting close to my time, I think. Uh, so we expect to use this quite heavily. So um, remember this, so this is a picture from the submitted manuscript. <sighs> Not sure what to say. So we did some of the largest hybrid DFT calculations ever. However, um, and this actually costs people their careers, right? They actually work on this hard, right? It's not easy. You actually need a working computer and you need to know how it works. So the reviewer, various reviewers had interesting comments. But this was also with experimental colleagues. But the interesting comments are that Finally, I actually worry that in some cases the supercell is not large enough despite its large number of atoms. In particular for the bismuth 2 case in figure 3b, that was actually 3d, I'm not sure why it's b. Within the utilized supercell, the bismuth atoms are actually second nearest neighbors. Oh, here, that's it. Right? Second nearest neighbors. It's a small supercell. We got that comment repeatedly from uh, the community, and I think that's because people are used to doing gallium arsenide, which is a great material except it is not organic and organic hybrid. Um, it doesn't have that many atoms, so all the other atoms are left away here, remember? Um, likely interacting, indicating that the supercell is too small. A hint of this can be seen in figure 3D, which shows that the defect orbitals are not flat as expected, but show some dispersion. Um, frustratingly, the Nature Communications editor was convinced by arguments such as these and thought it shouldn't be published. Um, but they wish us luck, um, and I wish, <laughs> I, wish, I wish them luck as well. Um, so we did some more work, right? Um, because of course we we didn't we weren't fundamentally limited, right? But it's, at some point it's a question of resources and how far can you push this? 
This calculation was actually not cheap, right? This is a slightly larger version, so now they're no longer second nearest neighbors. And this band, which is not colored in in this case, is no longer uh, curved very much. Now it's even flatter. So it's still a defect band, which is what we were proving in the original picture. So we put this in the supporting information, and we hope that eventually it'll get published. But um, it is true that going here exposed a few other things, because of course we tested water, but then um, this has way more electrons, and so you have to deal with way more electrons, and so it actually helped us to push this a little further, but it also cost a bit of time. And so that's what we did. We can do these calculations, right? And so thankfully the people who did this are still there, and without them this would never have worked. So we've been, been trying to push this code, um, FHI Ames, um, which I think really is an efficient and scalable first principles code for many purposes, to, to, to scalability, but for complex materials uh, for many years. One aspect that I haven't touched upon is that we're actually interested in, and I'm personally very interested in getting relativistic effects correctly, which are not in many codes, and so that should be doable given enough time. Uh, and we have some work on this. We, we do have a significant and an actually really fun investment in uh, large-scale eigenvalue and density matrix solver strategies. And also the, the SECAM electronic structure library is something that I enjoy very much, and it's been really, really very useful for us. And, and I, I try to convince you that very large-scale hybrid DFT calculations are now feasible. However, I worry that these bands are not 100%. <laughs> Thank you.